Thank you. Good evening. I get the privilege of introducing my boss, <laughs> Dr. Gail Beebe. Uh, Gail Beebe is in his sixth year as the, as the president of Westmont College. Uh, he served previously as president of Spring Harbor University in Michigan, and prior to that served as in the dean's role at Azusa Pacific University. He's an active scholar, has published numerous articles, uh, and edited several publications. Uh, his latest book is Shaping an Effective Leader, Eight Formative Principles, and that text that he'll be speaking out of uh, this evening. <coughs> He's also co-authored a book entitled Longing for God, Seven Paths of Christian Devotion with Richard Foster. Uh, he's a, he is a graduate of, uh, of George Fox University. He has a Master's in Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, as well as has a Master's of Business Administration and Strategic Management from the Peter Drucker School at Claremont Graduate University. He also earned his doctorate in philosophy of religion and theology from the Claremont Graduate University in 1997. Gail and his wife Pam have three children. Uh, Pam is a student at uh, Westmont. Liz, who played in a uh, playoff game last night, how did he do? They won. They won, okay, <laughs> great news. And Ricky, who is up the greater. Uh, you know you like your job when you look forward to spending time with your boss. And what I've appreciated about Gail is that uh, he has an unusual blend of an interest in strategic management and a pastoral side. So he's one of those individuals that when you we meet and we talk about difficult issues and opportunities behind the scene, he has an ability to cut to the key questions and the key strategic choices, and he never forgets the personal dimension and the pastoral care side of the people who are going to be affected by those decisions. And I get to see that in private. Uh, it's not something he just puts on display in public. It's something that affects the way he thinks about the work that he does. So I'm looking forward to what he has to say. And following that uh, presentation, we'll have two uh, faculty members from Westmont uh, respond, and, and I'll step up and introduce them at that time. So Gail, welcome. Thank Well, it's wonderful to be out tonight, and I appreciate so much your willingness to come. Uh, these are themes I love to think about, and themes that I've actually been thinking about for a, for a number of years. The impetus for the book was the experience of, well, it was a com combination of a variety of experiences, but all of them coalescing one day when I was sitting in a conference listening to a man extol the virtues of character. And he was saying, everything rises and falls on character. Great leaders have consistency of character and he was going on and on and I was totally totally committed to his point of view and then we got deeper into it and he kept going and I began to think about the fact that I knew him fairly well still know him fairly well and that he had ruined one organization was on the way to ruining the second one. <laughs> and so you, you know how when the speaker goes long enough that you can begin to rethink your view uh, I began to realize that it had to be more than just character, that character is the bedrock, but that it has to be more than character. I really began to recognize the threshold competencies that make leadership possible and really become necessary if you're going to sustain yourself in a job and lead an organization effectively. And that was really what spawned my interest in thinking about leadership. Uh, there are a variety of reasons I wanted to stay with Peter Drucker. I pursued this dual degree at Claremont. But my experience in the church, pastoring a church, uh, having gone to Princeton Theological Seminary, I never took a single class in how to lead and manage the local church. Got into the church as a pastor, and at least 50% of my time was taken up with the business side of the church. Well, I found myself talking to numerous people for whom this was the same experience, that they had been prepared in one way to go on in life, and every single one of us ended up having to think seriously and frequently about the business side of the organization, never having had any formal opportunity to do so. And so in 1990, my wife Pam and I moved to Southern California, uh, where uh, she began to teach middle school math at a middle school in Yorba Linda, and I would drive every day to and from Claremont to do my dual degree. And it really was just the most incredible time. It was very intense. I took two PhD seminars and two MBA classes every semester for three years. I had to write my qualifying exams, had to write my dissertation, eventually completed everything. Uh, officially graduated in 97, although at Claremont I finished in April of 96. 
But if you don't finish by March 31 of the year you're in, you don't get to graduate. I finished on April 16th and had to wait a full year. It made planning the graduation party really easy. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's get underway and uh, we'll uh, look at um, what I'd like to accomplish in the time that I'm, I'm up. I'd like to talk about my philosophy of leadership. Uh, touch briefly on the additional work of uh, some leadership experts, particularly the work of Sidney Finkelstein. And if you're a person who's interested in great, great thinkers on leadership, Finkelstein is my favorite in terms of having that kind of comprehensive mind. He wrote a book entitled Strategic Leadership. He is a prolific author, teaches at the Tuck School up at Dartmouth. And, uh, but he has the most amazing capacity to synthesize all of these writers uh, into a coherent whole. At the back of uh, uh, Strategic Leadership, I think his bibliography is about 80 pages, uh, probably eight, eight font, number eight font, number nine font. Small type, uh, but again, just an incredible mind. And then, uh, of course, with General Powell coming, I want to speak about uh, uh, General Powell. And I don't know him personally. I had the privilege of talking with him last uh, Friday morning in preparation for next Friday morning. My knowledge of him is from his two primary works and then a few speeches that we found on YouTube uh, that were educational. And, uh, but again, it was just a delightful conversation and, and I want to touch on that briefly. We, the, uh, the little booklet you should have found on your uh, chair when you arrived, what I do is I try to give you a sense of uh, where I've been in case you can't recognize it. And uh, that way, I'm never going to cover everything in the book, but I can highlight these and then you can reference them in the book or the booklet. And this is the Cliff Notes version of the book. So if you have the book uh, and you uh, have exhausted your interest in the book, this will give you the Cliff Notes version <laughs> of the book. Now, what's my goal as a leader? Uh, first and foremost, I think about wanting to maximize the God given potential of every person under my care. And I don't always do that successfully or as effectively as I wish, but that really is, every morning I wake up, I have time to myself, I read, I pray, I do my own disciplines, and I think about who I'm going to see during the day, who, what, how I need to be thinking of them, how I need to be praying for them, uh, and it prepares me uh, for the meetings I enjoy, it also prepares me for the meetings that I think will be less pleasant. And part of this is whether you're a person of faith or a person that is just a, a highly moral leader, I think you need to anticipate your work. You need to anticipate the people you'll be with because those are the people that are going to be impacted by your spirit and disposition. And the times when I am most disruptive is when I have not had that time to actually prepare myself for the day. And by most disruptive, I mean my response is not enhanced uh, the welfare of the college, it's, it's stymied it. And I think our responsibility as a leader is to try and be as effective as we can every day uh, that we're responsible for leading the organization. Now I need frameworks of meaning, and so I wanted to just spend a little time, just very brief time, talking about Immanuel Kant. This concept, or this principle that he has, concepts without percepts are empty, percepts without concepts are blind. That's the best thing you'll ever read of Kant. The, uh, what he means is that conceptions have to have perceptions and perceptions have to have conceptions and the only way to get them together is by interpretation. Now what's a very rudimentary way in which we interpret? As Americans that drive, we see a red light. We see, or we see a stoplight. We see, we perceive red, yellow, green. We have in our minds the conceptions stop, slow down, go. Our brain just automatically interprets that when we perceive a red light, we're to stop. When we see a yellow light, we're to slow down. Or in California, to accelerate. <laughs> and when we see a green light, we're to go. That is, at a very rudimentary level, uh, Kant's principle of concepts without percepts are empty, percepts without concepts are blind. And the fact that we really need to, to have both. Now, the definition of a plausibility structure, this comes from science. And the, the idea of a plausibility structure is how do we put together our experiences of life into a framework of meaning? And the challenge to this framework of meaning comes when we have new experiences that are actually disruptive. Now often leadership puts, puts us in situations where we're dealing with people that uh, create disruptions to the way in which we put meaning in life together. And I think some of the most challenging aspects of, of leadership are when you have problem employees 
and you don't know how long you should uh, try to develop them, and at what point you play that godlike role and actually terminate them. And these are moments which you really begin to evaluate your own roles and responsibilities, your own ethical framework, and what you believe about human nature, the human capacity to learn, the human capacity to grow, and whether or not you really believe you can make a difference in helping people change in order to be effective. My philosophy of leadership is summarized in the pyramid. Uh, and again, this goes back to me believing character is the foundation. And if I was to trace on this, character is with you at all aspects of life. And we often think of character as moral orientation, which I think is the initial definition that is important to us. And at each level of the pyramid, I think that there is a character dimension. I think there's a temptation that we face. It's, all, it's not always the same temptation. But there's also a moral order uh, that we can evoke, and I, I want to summarize that here in a minute. But I also think what goes with character is this principle that Warren Bennis has written about recently in an article entitled Crucibles of Leadership. And it's the idea that we go through painful experiences that actually are part of the refining of our character. And I think our culture actually says, if you're going through a miserable time, try to get away from it. In reality, the best development for a leader is when you face a crucible experience where it's a real trying and testing of both your own character and the purposes of the organization, these are times when you have to push into it. And unless you get ejected out by the board, I think it's an incredible opportunity to learn and grow and to be prepared for other challenges that will come later. Now I think in life, the challenges of life are a great opportunity for us to respond in the only two ways we can, which is we can control our attitude and effort. And that, those are the only two things we can consistently control. We can control how we respond to a situation, and we can also control what energy level we bring to it. And these also become dimensions of character. Competence, uh, I'll talk briefly or touch briefly on threshold competencies. Uh, those are identified both in the, in the booklet as well as in the, uh, as well as in the book itself. Each of these are a chapter in the book. Chemistry is something that you know, I just began to realize that as you ascend in responsibility, you, know, you start out getting attention because you're an individual achiever. But when you become a leader, you have to get your work done through other people. And you're often reliant on the capacity or the caliber of the chemistry of your team. Now, I, was, uh, I participated in competitive athletics for many years in, in football, basketball, and baseball. And you know the old adage, but the true adage that there are some teams that were less talented but more successful because the chemistry of the team was so good. But I think the same is true with leadership teams. When you have great chemistry on a team, it makes such a world of difference in terms of your ability to trust one another and be really effective uh, as you lead your organization. Culture is where I look both at culture and context. What is the organizational culture? How do you understand it? How do you influence it? And then culture is always within a, a context, an environmental context. And you can never see an organization separate from the context in which it's a part. Being president at Westmont is very different from being president at Spring Arbor. And one of the things that has been so, there's so many parts to having Mark here that have been meaningful to me and, and just incredibly enriching and enjoyable. One of them is, Mark was actually the chief academic officer at Spring Arbor for three years uh, before I ever came as president. And so I knew Mark by reputation. Uh, we, we did not know each other well. And then I knew Mark by great reputation at Gordon. It's just been an incredible blessing to have him come. One of the asides has been so enjoyable and is he and I loved the same people at Spring Arbor and we had problems with the same people at Spring Arbor. And it was one of those moments where it's just reassuring to find that out, because it kind of gives you a bearing on each other's personality and value system uh, as you come to understand it. But I often think about the fact, when we were at Spring Arbor, and this will just be a very simplistic illustration, but a very accurate one, if you had to go back to, to the county planners a third time on a building project, you were a total screw up. Now here, it took seven years to get our campus master plan through. It, it's impossible to conceive what it's like to deal with the county of Santa Barbara until you're actually here dealing with them. Second, when I heard the term wildfire, I mean, <laughs> wildfire, how could a wildfire be a threat? The fire station's right down the hill. And then you live through one, and you realize, well, nobody shows up because they're saving people. 
and the fire, the first responders are out being sure everybody's safe, they could care less about the structures. Well, that was another part of, you know, in Michigan, if a house is on fire, you, you know, you call 911, they show up, they put out the fire, nobody else's home is in danger. And even though we lived in Southern California for 10 years, wildfires are what happened like, you know, in San Diego. They didn't happen around us. And so I had never really had that perception. So I often think that culture is embedded in context and we have to be mindful of it. Compatibility. Compatibility is simply, I think any of us can do anything for a little while, but if we aren't fundamentally aligned with the values of our organization, we inevitably come apart. And I think part of the challenge for compatibility is, what do we do when uh, we feel pressured to the point that we make what I consider a career limiting mistake? And as I have seen people in situations where they just should have gotten out earlier, they get pushed beyond the bounds of their own discipline, uh, their own their own capacity to discipline and control themselves, and they lose their, their self-regulation, their capacity to really moderate their emotion. They overreact, they do something that really uh, kind of becomes explosive, out of character for them, and it, it leads to their termination. Now this has happened way too often, and I've seen it happen way too often, to think that it's just a, a, you know, an accident. I think we have to be more mindful of what are our values, what are the things that matter most to us, and are we in an organization, if we have a choice to be in an organization, are we in an organization that actually reflects that? Convictions, what do we believe should get done and how do we believe they should happen? I think these are very close to connections. I think one of the most difficult things for a, for a leader is to act with conviction and stay emotionally connected to your people, particularly if it's a decision that they won't like. And, uh, uh, I know that's one of the greatest challenges for me is to stay emotionally present when it's an unpleasant decision. And then the last one is commitment to purposes that will outlive us. And uh, the illustration I use there, it's chapter eight. It's my favorite chapter because it's a chapter I wrote in honor of my dad who uh, taught me so much about life and about leadership. Well, let's look briefly at uh, each of the slides and each of the principles in isolation. The eight principles of effective leadership, I guess I just summarized those. Oh, I did want to mention, here's the other capacity of the book that I, I really wanted to bring in, and it's how do we understand our own character development at each phase of our leadership responsibilities? Evagrius of Pontus is one of my favorite uh, thinkers in the history of the church. He lived in the fourth century. Uh, if, you've, if you've been in either the Roman Catholic or Protestant traditions, you're familiar with the seven deadly sins. Uh, Evagrius was actually the original thinker, and his were the eight deadly thoughts. They would eventually get compressed by Gregory the Great into the seven deadly sins, but the eight deadly thoughts, here's what happened. Evagrius, uh, he was headed for, he probably would have become Pope in the early church, but uh, he fell in love with a married woman, and that is a career-limiting mistake. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> So he's living in Constantinople, he has to flee, he goes first to Jerusalem, very unsettled there, and he eventually settles on the Egyptian desert out on the Sinai. And it's there that he begins to think back, how did a person with so much capacity, so much potential, so much brilliance, fall prey to temptation? And he recognized that what he had done is, he had given rise to these thoughts that he had given energy to. And in the process of giving energy to these thoughts, they had led him into paths of action that precipitated him falling in love with this married woman. There's no clear evidence that he consummated the relationship, but it's speculated wildly that it probably happened. Nevertheless, he spent the rest of his life on the Egyptian desert as a result of it. Well, the result of that is he turned the tragedy into a blessing to the church in that he thought back through how do we go through life and what are the temptations we face? And he, he laid out this very compelling scheme, gluttony, anger, greed, envy, pride, lust, indifference, and melancholy as the eight deadly thoughts. And he said, but they can be compensated by these eight godly virtues, temperance, mildness, generosity, happiness, humility, fidelity, diligence, and wisdom. And so I have been deeply impacted by Evergrace in my own thought, and I also began to recognize that different leadership principles have different challenges that go with them. And so I've tried to match the principle uh, to, to the temptation. Now in the first one, uh, I put gluttony with character because I think one of the great dangers for leaders is we are given to chronic overwork. We're workaholics. 
And gluttony we always think of as food. And Evergrius defines it initially as food, but he goes on to say, gluttony is a result of not trusting. It is a lack of ability to have confidence that there will be anything for tomorrow. And I often think that we fall prey to chronic overwork because we don't have confidence that things will settle out okay. Now we're in a very turbulent environment in higher ed, and I don't know that I fear for my job so much as I just want to stay ahead of the curve in terms of problems coming to higher ed generally and Westmont College specifically. And I find myself just constantly preoccupied with my work and really having to discipline myself to pay attention to the family, to pay attention to the personal needs of our kids, to pay attention to our own needs as a, as a married couple. And these are, these are ways in which I think we get distracted and fall prey to this very strong temptation. The second one is competence, and the, uh, the, those are in the outline, and so you can, I believe in character and its formation, so the fact that I accelerated through that, I hope, doesn't send the wrong signal. <laughs> uh, the importance of competence, this gets at uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, you, you do have to have character, but at some level you have to prove that you can get the job done, and I think that this is just very, uh, very important uh, that we not underestimate the fact that we have to do the work. And I often think that uh, people like Daniel Goldman, who writes about emotional intelligence, working with emotional intelligence, he uses the term uh, that essentially when you reach a certain level of responsibility, there's not that much difference between the competency level of the people. What kicks in is your capacity to work with people. How effective are you at getting work done through other people? And you have to develop the ability not only to perform individually, but actually get the work done uh, through other people. Now, I brought in the role of the liberal arts. Drucker was totally committed to the liberal arts being the best preparation for leadership because he said it, it taught you how to synthesize information from all the different disciplines. And a point that he made, I was with him from 90 to 93, and then I actually would stay in touch with him up until about six months before he died. But the, the uh, the interesting part is that he, he believed what you know today isn't what you'll need tomorrow. And you have to continually learn and you have to know how to absorb information from all disciplines because you simply don't know what information you'll need to solve the problems that you'll face in the future. Now, you know, I think about 1990, the internet had not even been invented yet. And so you think about what's happened in the 23 years uh, when I was first being exposed to this idea that you have to be a lifelong learner, that you have to be uh, constantly accumulating new information to stay relevant and effective, and how much has changed, uh, even in the last uh, two years as uh, the explosion of the iPhone and this whole move to uh, social media. Uh, there's uh, several things that are outlined here. Uh, the page nine, uh, page bottom of page 10, Drucker's eight practices of effectiveness. The um, Character development issue here is envy versus uh, contentment. And, and what Evergrey has said that I'd want to draw to your attention, I think that you have to become satisfied with your level of competency, and you have to be satisfied with it, or you will get destroyed by envy. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember the movie Amadeus, where Amadeus' rival, uh, Salieri, I think is how you say his name, it is the best portrayal, I wish I had a clip of that, it's the best portrayal of envy where he of all people struggles so hard to be a great court composer, and he of all people is the only one who can actually help us understand the genius of Mozart. Shows us the page that has no erasures on it. And, and yet he is just ruined by envy. Well so often, I think so much of the office politics that happens in organizations is driven by people resenting the gifts that God has given other people or that they've been able to develop. And one of the great contributions that you can make to your company is to learn contentment and learn the discipline of contentment as you do your work. Uh, three is chemistry, uh, the, the advantage of team chemistry. Uh, there's uh, a lot in this uh, that, that I enjoy thinking about, talking about. I was deeply influenced uh, by Dr. Steve Sample, who was president for 19 years at University of Southern California. Uh, the uh, Prior to that, he'd been at University of Buffalo in, in Western New York, and then uh, did a variety of things. Interesting, elect, trained as an electrical engineer, uh, among many of his patents is the keypad on your 
uh, electronic appliances like your, uh, uh, your oven or your microwave. And so he had this brilliant scientific mind, this wonderful way with people, and just a strategic mind, and extremely gracious and generous with his time. Uh, really a remarkable man. What I would want to draw your attention to starts on page 13, and this is Daniel Goleman's Emotional Competence Framework. What I found helpful in this, and what I wanted, would want to emphasize with you, is the importance of working in a way to both understand yourself and understand your responsibilities. And if you start with the personal competencies, you see right off the bat, he deals with three areas in, by which we gain self-awareness. The second is how we gain self-regulation, or the capacity for self-regulation. And this gets back to how do we avoid making career-limiting mistakes? In so many cases, people lose the capacity for self-regulation, and it, it doesn't always end with them not getting a job or losing the job they have. But it causes people to withdraw from wanting them to be in positions of responsibility. And I, I think uh, Goldman has just helped us so much in really understanding both our personal responsibilities, but also the way we have to, to work interpersonally uh, to be effective. Social competencies, empathy, I'm developing a huge interest in this, uh, both because I believe in it, and also that the measurement tools within neuroscience have become so skilled at actually assessing the degree to which we have empathy. And so I'm working with Dr. Tom Fikes, who is uh, uh, in our psychology and neuroscience department. We actually did uh, a study. I'm teaching a class right now with Rick Eflin, the EB150 uh, seminar in executive leadership. We had the students take these intake instruments at the start of the class. They think it's about something else. It's really about do they have empathy? And, uh, and so they had to all go in, put the skull cap on, go through these uh, EEG exams and we're going to talk about it in two weeks and it is it's just classic now is helen here is helen still here or did she leave my assistant no helen i don't need you i was going to talk about you i was hoping you weren't here <laughs> the uh, we ended up with one extra slot and so helen ended up volunteering <laughs> and, and she also will be analyzed in two weeks <laughs> But empathy, and if you read uh, the literature, there's so much being said right now that people want to work for somebody who displays empathy in part because they want to feel, even if a hard decision has to be made, that it's a person that actually understands them and feels human emotion uh, rather than just these, uh, these cold, uh, uh, these images of the cold raiders uh, that uh, just take over companies, dismantle the parts, and sell them off. Now I remember, do you remember the book Swimming with the Sharks or something like that? Do you remember when that came out? That was so interesting to me and I was watching Shark Week. Uh, you know, I have an enormous respect for sharks, which some would interpret as a huge fear. And, uh, but it was so interesting, I was watching this, that book had come out and, it, you know, Shark Week happens every year. And they mentioned the fact that sharks have one of the most primitive brains and the part of the human brain that has a capacity for love is completely missing from the shark brain. I found that interesting. Now that's never mentioned in the books when with the sharks. But you think about the fact that what they're extolling is the ability to be ruthless when in fact a shark actually doesn't even have a capacity to make the human connection and what people are longing for is a human connection. When Eileen, one of our faculty, one of our professors who's going to respond tonight, she's in the biology department and one of the articles that we actually have the students read is the biology of leadership which is looking at this Biology is the substrata for all the work being done in neuroscience. Talk about managing an executive team, then chap or principle four gets into, uh, oh, this is the emotional competence framework. Well, that is just a great book. Uh, Working with Emotional Intelligence is the name of the book. It came out in 2002, if, if you want to read it. So it's 11 years old, but still really, really compelling. Uh, the interplay of culture and context. Um, This is a great quote from Drucker. Each of the principles I start with a quote, uh, quote from Drucker. Uh, you know, he's a prolific author. Uh, when you li live to almost 96 years old and you start writing when you're 30, it gives you a long runway. Culture shape people, and then I highlight these uh, eight, or pardon me, these four principles from this book by Collins and Porus, Built to Last. It compares 18 great companies with 18 ulcerants. Now, here's what's interesting to me as you go on in life is. When this book came out, of course, it was a bestseller and widely heralded. 
I need to go back through it, but I think something like six or seven of the companies that are featured as the great companies have gone bankrupt. And so we're now having to revisit the fact, and this is the reality, that you know, in, in Good to Great, it, it, Colin's next book, or a supplementary book, he extols the virtues of Circuit City. We used to love to shop at Circuit City. Well, Circuit, Circuit City is gone. And so we have to pay attention to both the principles, but then the fact that they're always in flux. Here's what I like. Fervently held core ideology, process of friendly indoctrination, tightness of fit between the individual and the company, which would be compatibility. And then this cultivation of a spirit of positive elitism. Now, I have worked in either the church or nonprofit organizations or higher ed my whole life, my whole adult life. And in those, what, would, what Drucker would call the third sector economy, the first sector being business, the second sector government, the third second sector, the nonprofit, I don't find so much a cultivation of a spirit of positive elitism as cultivation of a spirit that what you're doing has a specific and important role to play in the improvement of society. And, and that has a tinge of humility with it. And I think so many of the third sector uh, organizations really have that great sense that what they're doing uh, is important to the fabric of society. And if they weren't doing it, there would be some missing gap in the betterment of life. And I think that that is complementary to what Collins and Porus are getting at, but, but also highlights that. Six ways organizational culture is influenced and established. Uh, and then I cite Red Polling. This was a dear friendship that developed when I was in Michigan. Red is the retired chair and CEO of Ford Motor. He actually passed away last summer at the age of 87. Uh, but in, in my book, uh, Red gave me permission to reprint his one-page philosophy of leadership. I just think it's a masterpiece. It's on page 87 of the book. And here's the way it happened. Uh, Red, as he ascended uh, through the ranks at Ford, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. I was once in a student meeting with Red where a student asked him, you know, how do I become CEO at Ford Motor? And essentially, that's what he was asking. He actually asked, how did you become CEO at Ford Motor? And Red's whole uh, point was, whatever job you're doing, do it to the absolute best of your ability and do it without thinking you're going to do anything else. And people will select you. And he said, I did, he went in as a audit clerk at Ford in 1951. And then he was given a little more responsibility, a little more. Pretty soon they were spreading his range of responsibilities. He would eventually run Ford Europe. He'd come back, run Ford North America, become president and COO of the company, and then chairman and CEO. And actually, in that conversation, he talked about the fact he had taken retirement, and the board, uh, the Ford board of directors asked him to come out of retirement when he actually became CEO, so he said, in my plan, I was never going to be chairman and CEO. But that one-page philosophy of leadership is just such a compelling statement. And at the time that he wrote it, uh, Ford Motor had 400,000 employees, and he ran it by the principles on that single sheet of paper. And I, I think it's just a compelling witness that if you get the cultural elements right, uh, it can be very powerful. Uh, seven key elements, uh, the environmental context. I, Robert Wuth now, I don't know if any of you have been in Santa Barbara long enough to remember when he actually taught out at UCSB. He's a great sociologist. He now teaches at Princeton University. He's been there about 15 years. But this is taken from his book, Communities of Discourse. In fact, Dr. Pointer and I have talked about this before when we've talked about our study abroad program. Uh, but I was very influenced by Wuth now and the way in which you look at how societies get structured. Now here's my point. This isn't meant to be a diversion from leadership, but a recognition that every organization is embedded in a culture. It's embedded in a context. And one of Drucker's points to us when we were going through the, the MBA was so many companies make the mistake of believing that the way in which it works where they're headquartered is the way that it works everywhere. And so they end up in just these terrible situations because the regulatory environment is completely different. Now here's a decision we've been facing that <coughs> has been very educational for us. We've been looking at how we can expand our, our semester abroad programs. And so we began to look at, you know, should we buy properties, should we lease properties? And we were looking seriously, not that we had the money to do it, but you know, probably a preference to, if we go into another country, to buy a property and to follow the pattern that some other universities have set. Well, it turns out that if you buy property in countries like Italy, 
it exposes you to a whole new burden of taxation that you don't face if you lease property. Now, that is the way in which uh, our ignorance of the regulatory environment could have led us into just a disastrous decision. Whereas, you know, retaining a person who actually has knowledge of that environment helped us make the right decision and avoid a very costly mistake. But I also enjoy uh, sociology, and so bringing WEF now in was, was enjoyable from a personal standpoint, too. Twelve core competencies that shape a healthy culture, the character development, anger versus mildness. This is interesting. Evagrius, again, fourth century, and so we kind of discount him as a long since dead person. What would they know about psychology? But he talks about what causes human anger. He said, at its core, it's the violation of the way we felt life should have gone. And I thought, man, how often is that the case? Where, and, and he goes on to explain, you know, humans believe either consciously or unconsciously that fundamental agreements have been made. And what triggers their anger is when those fundamental agreements are not honored. And so he talks about how anger is one of the worst sins because it actually destroys human community. And, and then you, you just begin to extrapolate from that in all the ways in which anger actually does. Destroy friendship, destroy marriage, destroy human community. Number five, compatibility. We don't need to spend a ton of time on this, but uh, this gets at the reality of how well do you understand yourself and how well do you understand the organization you're a part of. And then on page 22, I do a summary of the 12 questions that Marcus Buckingham and Kurt Kaufman concluded uh, were the key questions to, to determining who are your most satisfied employees. If you're familiar with the Strength Finders work, these guys have been involved in Strength Finders work. One of their early studies was this study commissioned by the Gallup organization where they looked at 1,600 different companies and surveyed 85,000 employees. And these 12 questions were the, the employees who could answer with the highest affirmation of these questions were your most satisfied employees. Do you remember the study 10 years ago made best places to work? This was the under, this was the survey that gave rise to the whole best places to work. Uh, and it points out people who are most satisfied and the kind of environment that they need to be in in order to, to be most effective. Principle six, leading with convictions. Uh, again, this is where uh, Drucker just talked about the courage of leadership, where you have to make tough choices and uh, that the, the company, the rise and fall of the company is based on your courage to make choices that not a lot of other people are supporting. And, and yet the fact that as you make them, uh, you, you have to be willing to stand by them and recognize uh, that it's going to be a while before uh, they may prove to be the right one. Now here is a guy that I bring in that I just really admire. And I don't see in my outline here, I hope I didn't accelerate through it, but I may have. Yeah, Dr. Robert Keaton. How the way we talk can change the way we work. Keegan is a professor at Harvard. Uh, he also uh, runs his own consulting business. Uh, this is a bad title for a great book. And what he talks about, it, he did a longitudinal study and also a qualitative study. And he was trying to determine what makes for the best places to work. Very, very much similar to some of the questions of first break all the rules. Now, here's what he discovered that I, I just, right off the bat, I was hooked. They did a survey and they found that of the people defining as most satisfied, even within the group of most satisfied, 67% of their conversations included some form of complaint. And these were your most satisfied employees. And so he began to look at, surely people aren't this disgruntled. And this is as he went across companies, organizations, industries. It, it was not like it was restricted to one segment of the economy. And what he discovered is that complaining often was just a superficial expression or a surface expression of a deeper health commitment. And what was being violated or challenged was that deeper health commitment. And his encouragement to us was, when you hear complaints, don't just dismiss them. Try and hear what is the, you know, that, the complaint is the presenting problem. What is the real problem? And can you go, do you have the discipline to look beneath the presenting problem to what the real problem is to see if it's a legitimate concern or if it is, in fact, just a disgruntled employee? But he also said, pay attention to the people who are the key opinion leaders in your company, because the key opinion leaders, if they have a complaint, it is going to be taken as a legitimate complaint, whether you believe it to be one or not. 
Now I go through the uh, three other personal languages, language of blame to the language of personal responsibility, language of New Year's resolutions, the language of competing commitments, I like that one. And his point here was everybody on January 1 wants to lose weight. By January 30th, other things are pressed in on the schedule, they're no longer exercising as much. Unless you're, you know, Bob Cates, and then you exercise every day. From the language of big assumptions that hold us to the language of assumptions we hold, and then the three social languages. I, I love these. The, to move from a language of prize and praising to a language of ongoing regard. Now, I certainly can, can get into just, you know, general praise, which is a kind of violation of the principle. But his point was, instead of saying, you know, Richard had an awesome speech at commencement, say, you know, I really appreciate Richard's speech. It was timely, uh, it was compact, incredibly elegant, and it focused on the role of literature to life. Something like that. I mean, he said, be specific. And because a person wants to know, when you say, Rick, that was an awesome article, Rick walks away wondering, well, what part of it did he like? Did he like the whole thing? Did he like the introduction? Did he like the conclusion? And it's a way in which we can be much more specific. And then I cite Dave McKenna and the six qualities of the self-differentiated leader, which actually I do think are profound. Uh, this is, uh, you know, never lose connection relationships when making convictional decisions. This is on 25. Never cast blame when stating the case. Never put on a gas mask in a toxic environment. What Dr. McKenna meant by this is so many times we see a problem and we just don't want to deal with it, or we don't want to deal with it right now. And so the image is, you put on a, a gas mask so that you don't actually have to deal with the problem, and you just kind of endure it. Well, the problem doesn't get better, it doesn't go away, and in fact, it intensifies. Never create a triangle, never delay direct confrontation, never hesitate to deal with saboteurs. The, uh, um, I do some uh, with Drucker and Connections. Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples of Connections uh, is Bob Emmons, who's a wonderful local uh, retired uh, both leader and, and former professor. And what I enjoy about Bob is he has this capacity and had a capacity, I've talked to several people who worked with him and for him, uh, to deliver really hard news in a very, uh, uh, not easy way, but a gentle way, a way in which people could receive it. He would do things to actually, the way he engineered change within Spartan Final was always coming alongside and providing an educational opportunity for people who felt they'd be victimized by the change. Now, can you imagine what it feels like? I certainly can. If you think you're going to be displaced by technology, and yet you have the CEO show up and say, we don't want you to lose your job. Here's where the jobs are going, and here's the training we're going to provide so that you can get retrained uh, to serve in the new role. You would be so much more open to that type of change than just working to resist it. And this was, again, one of the things that I think Bob did so well. Several things they did there, that was under the, the byline of Smart University. And then Principle 8, page 29, is just some principles I learned from my father about making an ultimate contribution. Uh, he grew up on a farm in Eastern Oregon that my, parent, my grandparents homesteaded during the Great Depression. So m many of his, uh, you know, his examples were always uh, farm wisdom, either from working with animals or his favorite activity or the way he loved to make money growing up was uh, he would break horses. They'd go into the box canyons of eastern Oregon, capture these wild horses, and then he loved to, uh, he loved to uh, break them in and sell them to area ranchers. But the, uh, you know, be emotionally present. Uh, it would be annoying to you if I was up here doing a lecture and also texting, and yet that's kind of the way in which uh, society has gone, that we're only half present most of the time to the conversations and responsibilities that we have. Contribute to the quality of life of your entire community. Develop a bias for action. Create a positive atmosphere wherever you go. Don't settle in public what should be settled in private. And that was, you know, when I was coming of age, people would talk about the Asian culture is a face-saving culture, and I remember one time going, man, I don't like to be humiliated in public, so uh, I don't know if I'm Asian, but I certainly prefer uh, that culture. And uh, I think we're all that way. I don't think we want to be embarrassed uh, in front of our friends, peers, or the people that, whose respect we want to engender. 
Draw on your own wisdom tradition. We all have one. Maintain your moral compass. Maximize the gifts of those under your care. Be open to learning from anyone. And he was very, very big on this, that you don't know who is going to come with a solution, so respect everyone. Understand your context in order to make your absolutely best contribution. Now, these are the ways in which... I feel like when Richard Beebe is your dad. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Richard Beebe is my dad, not my son, although they both have the same name. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he, uh, uh, he died prematurely, or what I would consider prematurely. Uh, he was a post school superintendent and actually uh, died, died at age 60. So, uh, back in 1989. But a wonderful, wonderful influence on me, and and uh, just uh, uh, and there's so many things that come to mind. I mean, he's the one that, and I again, I don't know what was original with him, but it was certainly original. The context uh, I was talking to him about, I had gotten drawn into this disagreement. This is when I was in pastoral ministry, and he goes, "Look, son, it's like wrestling with a pig. You both get dirty, and the pig loves it." Now, those are the kinds of things that he would say. You know, to just kind of uh, you know push back out of this. Don't get drawn into it because it's a no-win situation. And I often think about things he said to me uh, in different contexts. And thankful that that uh, I was 30 when he passed away, and so old enough to have developed an adult friendship with him, which I really enjoyed. I want to just spend a brief amount of time talking about Colin Powell, and to just again to facilitate this. I'm just. Being a native of Oregon, I love using paper because it stimulates the economy in Oregon. So here is a handout, and these are just uh, outline remarks of what I think are uh, worth remembering. Here are the two books that, that uh, are the main ones on Colin Powell. This one, The American Journey, came out in 95. Uh, it worked for me is in 2011. So the, the 95 one really deals with a lot of his childhood, his coming of age, and his, uh, uh, both his work in the first Bush administration and then also the influence of the military on him. The second book is really more about his reflections on life after his UN speech. Now, it includes much more than that, but for him, Frozen in Time is that speech, February 5th, 2003, when he convinces the UN that, or he is convinced, that there's weapons of mass destruction. And he said it's burned in his mind because everybody always reminds him of it. Now here are the principles that, uh, the, the reason I use the term plausibility structures, again a technical term, but it just means structures of meaning. I think it's very helpful to begin thinking about how do each of us ascend to the responsibilities that we have and what were the influences on us? And as you think about uh, uh, Colin Powell, as you think about yourself, as you think about any, any individual, there are ways in which we're influenced. Now Finkelstein in his book Strategic Leadership talks about psychological factors, the role of education, life experience, career opportunities, functional <coughs> backgrounds, meaning the, what did you do on your way to a responsibility? Uh, what was your functional background? And then international experience. How many of them do you have? What do you think about them? How did they influence you? Now as you go on, the, uh, uh, these are just literally principles from, from Colin Powell. Apparently he was asked to write an article and, and on how did he govern, and he wrote, wrote it out as 13 rules. I don't remember it, it came out in Craig Magazine. He references it in his book and it's footnoted in uh, the second book, It Worked For Me. These are the 13 rules that he lists in the book. Uh, it ain't as bad as you think. Now, ain't got captured by my autocorrect, uh, and I had to respell it twice to get it through. <laughs> Look better in the morning, get mad, then get over it. Avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. It can be done, which is his spirit of optimism. Be careful what you choose, you may get it. Don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. You can't make someone else's choices. You shouldn't let someone else make yours. Check the small things. Share credit. Remain calm. Be kind. Have a vision. Be demanding. Don't take counsel of your fears or your naysayers. And have perpetual optimism uh, as it's a force multiplier. But that you know, it just has a geometric effect uh, in terms of how it impacts people. Now his personal story is fascinating. He grew up in the Bronx. 
He was the son of Jamaican immigrants. They worked hard. He had his first job uh, when he was 14 working for a Russian immigrant shop owner who owned a toy company. And uh, his parents worked in the garment district. And they often worked double shifts. And so he spent a lot of time alone, uh, spent a lot of time under the care of extended family members. And he just speaks with respect and pride of the role that his parents, his siblings, and his extended family played in his own formation. He grew up in an Episcopal church. He talks about his love for the priests, uh, the Episcopal priests, uh, what they meant to him. He's still active in the Episcopal church in suburban Washington, D.C. Uh, talks about all of the clubs. Now here is what's so generous in his personality. He talks about what he learned from good bosses, but also what he learned from bad bosses. And then he also talks about what he learned from good friends and what he learned from bullies. And, and it's just, it's amazing to me that I have never thought of anything that I've learned from bullets, and, uh, other than, you know, I want to avoid them, and, uh, uh, or bad bosses. But, you know, he's right, that if we can re reconfigure some of these very miserable experiences and recognize that even miserable experiences can be great teachers, uh, we can really be, be a continuous learner. Uh, these are... Page two has some other things. Uh, needs to, need to achieve a work-life balance. Kindness works. Be motivated to be a problem solver. He is great about just saying, look, if you're a leader, you exist to solve problems. Don't complain about problems. That's why you exist. And, uh, you know, I always, the great benefit of problems is it's job security. And, uh, you know, it's, when I was in pastoral ministry, we joke about sin is a growth industry. We'll always be employed. <laughs> Know where you function best on the battlefield. Now, this is his phrase for uh, when you're in a situation, what is the way in which you operate best? And he makes several military analogies that are really compelling. And he talks actually about the deployment of MacArthur, Eisenhower, and Marshall. And that Franklin Roosevelt made the decision to keep Marshall in Washington, D.C., even though Marshall wanted to be the one occupying either Europe or Asia, and it's or, or Japan. And it's just a fascinating analogy to think about that Marshall was best as a strategist and that Roosevelt truly did not want to make him vulnerable to death because he needed his mind in order to figure out his total war strategy. But you know, you think about sometimes people have ambitions and the ambitions are good ones, but other times they're ones that will actually get, get them outside of their best, the, the expression, the best expression of their gifts. And so being able to make that judgment where you want a person challenged enough so they're growing, but also close enough to the best expression of their gifts so that they can make a great contribution. Spheres and pyramids, this is an analogy that he uses and will use uh, talking about the military where everybody, he said in the military, you are completely dependent on the leaders you create. You do not go to another, there's no other organizations that the military goes to to find its colonels, its majors, its generals. And so, you have to have this uh, replenishment cycle. And uh, the spheres and pyramids are, can you take on a greater sphere of influence and can you rise in the pyramid uh, to have the capacity for greater, greater influence and leadership? Potential for the future, uh, not just the performance in the past, and then he outlined several eight things that uh, uh, lead to promotion. One that I really liked was number eight, the ability to recover from mistakes. And this, I think, is just so important, is both your ability to recover from mistakes you make, and then your ability as a leader to create an atmosphere where a person can take a chance, a calculated risk, and if it doesn't go right, they don't feel ruined by it. And I think that that is just such a great quality to instill in an organization that makes people to, willing to take calculated risk because they know that they won't be targeted uh, if it doesn't all go, go uh, perfectly. Have a teachable spirit. Uh, learn from experience, uh, always remove subordinates who are not in harmony with you, need act after action reviews, which are his way of look at the plan, make a plan, execute the plan, and then see how the plan worked out. Now, one of our alums, Ken Rogers, has a major responsibility at Westmont. I'm just about done, and I'll turn it over to the others. But Ken, uh, I saw Ken when I was back in Washington last April, and he said of all of the secretaries of state that have worked at the State Department, where Ken has been for 30 years, he said Colin Powell is the most beloved, and he considers him to be the best secretary of state in the modern history of the State Department. And he said because he didn't look at just his time in the State Department, he's the only one who actually 
created something that would go on after he left, and that was a leadership institute. And he created this leadership institute that is still going years after he's been done and has been embraced both by Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. I thought that that was pretty impressive, and so I wanted to just let you know, and this is my public announcement and advertisement. We have uh, started laying plans for our own Institute for Global Learning and Leadership, and we look forward to talking to you about it later. I'll turn it back to Mark at this time.